uh, it is an honor to represent class one, which is all of physical and mathematical sciences. Um, I took the task that I was asked to uh, say something about our career path, quite literally, you'll see in the first few slides. For example, this is where I was born. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, actually a, it's a rock quarry in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, and rocks have been pretty much a part of my life since then. This is the Wissahickon Schist, which in fact crops out very near here in Rock, rock Creek Park in Washington, D.C. And I picked up the garnets and the micas. I had a mineral collection. My mother took me uh, to, and my, who's in the audience, took me to the Delaware Mineralogical Society meetings when I was in third grade. And we continued to go on field trips. And my mother actually became so interested in geology that she got a second master's degree, worked for the Delaware Geological Survey, and authored the bedrock map of the state. One might think Delaware is small, but my mother knows every rock in Delaware. And this is the best, this is the best outcrop. Uh, I was an undergraduate at Dartmouth College, and uh, we were promised as a, as a major that we were guaranteed to see an erupting volcano. So that, of course, had a big influence on many of us. Uh, we went to Costa Rica, where Arenal was erupting. Probably some of you have seen Arenal erupt. It's been erupting for 20 years. It, it recently stopped. This is uh, Irazu Volcano. It's the biggest one. You can see the Atlantic and the Pacific from the top. And I was at a lecture, uh, a morning lecture in the jungle, and uh, one of the young professors at Dartmouth, Barbara Barrero, who had just been a hotshot postdoc here at Carnegie in Washington, was talking about a discovery that came from an isotope beryllium-10. Beryllium-10 is formed in the atmosphere. It's a cosmogenic isotope. It rains down on the surface of the Earth. It's absorbed onto to, to soils and in sediments, and even in the ocean, marine sediments. It's radioactive, so it starts to decay with a half-life of about one and a half million years. So it's gone after 10 million years. It's a tracer of, of young material, geologically young material uh, in sediments. And the discovery was these scientists found it erupting out volcanoes like, like Irazu. What was this young tracer doing erupting when we think magmas come from deep and old parts of the Earth? And of course, the connection was through the subduction zone, through the oceanic floor that's being subducted. And this was not lost upon me, sitting on the flank of Irazu and thinking about sediments offshore, subducting with the cocos plate, like a conveyor belt underneath the volcanoes, that it was literally happening under our feet, something tectonic that was linking the volcanism to processes on the seafloor. And this shaped really the first 10 years of my career. I did end up even going out to sea being a, a chief scientist on ocean drilling program crews to drill the oldest ocean crust in, the, in uh, the Western Pacific, actually anywhere in the ocean, 170 million year old crust off the Marianas Trench, you'll recognize. And it, it really brought home what's usually a, a, a leap of faith that plate tectonics is this slow process that, that we have to imagine or create models to explain. We can't see it happening. Um, and it somehow, in this case, was very real. We were trying to connect processes that were hundreds of kilometers away through a subduction zone. Um, I alternated between going out to sea and working on volcanoes, so to look at the input and look at the output through the planet. This is work uh, in the Western Aleutian Islands and Sea Guam Island. You can really only get out there on a boat. That was the fish and wildlife boat that took us out there. And we're looking at the volcanic deposits, this time tracing not just beryllium-10, but half the periodic table from the sediments on the seafloor into the mantle and back out the volcano. So this is cool, this kind of geochemical cycle that happens through the deep earth. But it's really missing the process that happened. And many of us became fixated on the chemical species that's the most important one to this process. And that is water itself. Water is in the ocean. It gets locked up on the seafloor, it gets subducted. The entire ocean actually gets subducted every two billion years. Fortunately, it comes back out again. Uh, it gets trapped into minerals that break down in the subduction zone as they're heated. They release fluids that transport things like beryllium-10 and these other elements. And then water lowers the melting point in the mantle enough to cause the magmatism itself. And it drives the buoyancy for the magma to come back to the surface and erupt. So water is everything. It's the medium and the message, but it's really hard to measure. Uh, consider the volcanic rock. Uh, it's, a, it's a piece of beauty. It's glass because it erupts as magma and quenches as glass. But you can see it's full of holes, and that's all the water that's actually escaped. So the water is completely gone from every rock that erupts. How do we measure it? 
And we, used to, we, we, like to, we like to use the seltzer bottle as, as, a, as an analogy, because when the cap is on, the CO2 is dissolved. At low pressure, when we take the cap off, the solubility drops, CO2 comes out as bubbles. The same thing happens in magmas. You can, you can dissolve tens of weight percent of water in magmas at depth, but then as they rise through the earth and lower pressure, the solubility drops, the water exsolves as bubbles, and by the time it erupts, all the water has, has exsolved as bubbles. And so the rock is left with nothing in it. How do we tell how much water was in the magma before it erupted? How do we know how much CO2 is in the seltzer bottle before we open it? And so this has not been an easy thing for us to figure out. What we need is a messenger that actually trapped some of the magma at pressure before it degassed that we can measure. We'd really like to measure something and not try to measure nothing. So what we've used uh, are crystals. These are uh, crystals of olivine. It's a magnesium silicate. It's the gemstone peridot. Olivine forms at high temperature in magmas, and sometimes it accidentally encloses pieces of the magma. You're seeing there a frozen bit of magma inside an olivine crystal. It's now quenched to glass, and we hope that it still has its inventory of volatiles dissolved in it because it's kept under pressure and kept from degassing. You can see in this picture, it even has a little tiny vapor bubble in it. That's, that's mostly CO2, that what's in, the, what's in the glass is still water. And we know that because we polish into the glass and analyze it by ion microprobe. We actually use the facility here at the Carnegie Institution of Washington and can measure the water dissolved in the glass. So this was occupying a lot of research, including mine, over the past 10 years. How much water is in magmas before they erupt? And so we fanned out around the world, 10 years, that's about five PhD theses. So my student Katie worked on the Marianas Islands. My student Mindy worked in the Aleutians, where you really have to take helicopters and boats. Lauren, she worked on the Tonga Islands, which mostly erupt submarine. So she had to go out to sea and dredge the rocks. And Jen and Alex worked on Central America, where most of the volcanoes are in national parks. And from this, we're, we, we got a good picture of how much water was dissolved in magmas, uh, how hot the mantle had to be when it was melting, how much water cycled through the subduction zone, lots of, interesting, lots of interesting questions were answered. But one that was kind of staring us in the face, uh, we hadn't quite addressed yet. And that is, it may seem obvious to you, but to us it's an annoyance. It's a, uh, whoops, it's the volcano itself. I'm sorry that picture didn't come out. Um, what you'll see is a, a picture of, of a volcano that's just oozing lava and another volcano that's exploding ash into the sky. I'm sorry, it's the exciting one that you can't see. Uh, it's a redoubt volcano in Alaska, what an airplane flew into and, uh, and fell 8,000 feet. Um, why do these volcanoes erupt so differently? What's different about them? And what does the water have to do with it? Um, the textbooks tell us the answer. These volcanoes are not that different. They're all in subduction zones. One's in the, they're both in the North Pacific. They must have different water contents, different gas contents. If the gas is the fuel in the seltzer bottle, then it's also the fuel in the magma. Um, it turned out that it had never actually been tested, but we kind of had the data to test it. And what we found out was kind of disappointing, as these things are. You can see it. So I've stacked these in terms of uh, their volcanic explosivity index. It's much like the earthquake magnitude scale. It's an order of magnitude scale. So the VEI-2 is, is 10 times bigger than the VEI-1 eruption. You can see that the VEI-4 is 100 times bigger than that. Big subplinian eruption here. Oh, that's the one that you should have seen. And you can see that we worked on uh, all three of these volcanoes, and those are the original water contents of the magma before it erupted. And uh, it's kind of uh, uh, disappointing that there isn't that much difference in the water contents. That's barely uh, beyond our uncertainties of about a half a weight percent. So it's not the total amount of water. It's even worse than that. Our community at this point has measured this, this quantity in about 60 different volcanoes, and they're all the same. Everything's between three and five weight percent, which is quite an interesting observation, but it's not helping us with the explosion problem. So it must be something else. And for that, we could, we could, we could go back to the seltzer bottle. I, I usually bring a seltzer bottle and erupt it, but I didn't think that was appropriate for the National Academy. <laughs> so you can imagine this. If I shook up the seltzer bottle and I handed it to you and I said, don't let it explode, what would you do? You go, ch -ch -ch, right? You release it slowly. So there must be a rate term in this that's important. It's not just the total amount of bubbles, it's how the bubbles get out. And so what these diagrams show are different kinds of bubbly magma mixtures. The bubbles are, are the uh, white circles. And if the magma moves up slowly, 
then the bubbles can stream out ahead, okay? Much like a glass of beer at the limit sits on the table and just passively degasses. Or if the bubbles coalesce, and they're big bubbles, big bubbles can definitely stream out faster than viscous melt. Um, however, if the magma rises really rapidly, it carries the bubbles with it. And not just that, there's a feedback, because the faster it rises, the faster it oversteps the, the saturation, the more nucleation points there are, the more bubbles there are at the limit that all the bubbles converge, and you have a gas mixture that erupts explosively. So we can envision both from the Seltzer bottle and from how gas-liquid mixtures work that there must be a rate term. And so we need a clock. And we need a clock in geology that works really quickly for geology. We are usually talk millions of years. This operates over minutes. And so we need a really, really fast clock. And what we've done for this, again, is turn to the crystals. The crystals are the archive of the eruption. They tell us what happened at depth before the eruption. This, again, are the olivine crystals. But instead of trying to find completely enclosed melt, we're looking for melt tubes that have a bubble at the outlet, like this one. This is a melt tube or an embayment with a bubble at the outlet. And what happens is at depth, the melt tube is in equilibrium with the melt around the crystal, has lots of water in it. Then as the system starts to decompress and the water exolves into bubbles on the outside, it can't really uh, do anything but diffuse along the melt embayment to the closest bubble, which is quite, quite far away. So if we know the diffusivity, we know the length scale, we can calculate the time scale of that leaking process through the, through the tube. We again use uh, uh, nanosims this time. Those are the nanosim spots. They're five micron spots that can measure water and CO2, sulfur and chlorine and fluorine gradients along this melt tube to that bubble. So this is how it might work if we just have a, a scale bar here for distance. This is along the melt tube from the inside to the outside of the tube. And we originally have abundant water that's homogeneously distributed in the, in the tube and in the outside magma. And then we let the system decompress. After a few minutes, the outside melt loses water to bubbles, and the embayment's trying to keep up with that. It does on the outside, but it's not on the inside. After five minutes, we decompress more. The outside stays in equilibrium, but not the inside. So we keep going six minutes, seven minutes. This is how water diffuses through a melt tube. If we stop the magma at this point and let it equilibrate, the melt tube would be flattened out in a couple hours. It would all have two and a half weight percent equal to the exterior. But if we let it keep ascending at this rate, eight minutes, nine minutes, 10 minutes, this is what it would look like. So now we'd like to compare this to data that we've collected. And when we do that, these are data that we've collected for that VEI4 eruption, the Fuego eruption. We see it corresponds to something like nine minutes of ascent at that rate at really quite an astonishing rate. It's on the order of tens of meters a second. So nine minutes for magma to rise 10 kilometers depth. In the time it's taken for me to give this talk, the magma's gone from the magma chamber to the surface, uh, literally moving at uh, 60 kilometers an hour, like a freight train, okay? This is not much time if you're worrying about preparing people for eruptions. Uh, we like to uh, try to listen to the eruption Magma doesn't move quietly. It creates little earthquakes sometimes as it rises. If we hear the rise happening over hours, maybe that's good. It means the magma's degassing and it's going to erupt peacefully. If it's rising really fast, well, we can't get out of the way anyway. It's kind of the worst case scenario. It's the very worst eruptions are the ones that happen so fast that we don't have time to get out of harm's way. Um, okay, well, this is getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, we only really have two data points. So um, I've just shown you the data that we've collected for Fuego Volcano in Guatemala, the nine or 10 minutes, or maybe 30 minutes, given the uncertainties for that eruption. The group has worked on the, the famous 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption, and they've estimated two minutes to come from six kilometers depth, so moving even five times faster to create an order of magnitude more explosive eruption. And you can see where we're going with this. Sea Guam's next, the very small eruption, is it indeed moving up slower than the others and degassing more efficiently? So we're fanning out around the world again to look at magmas that rise at different speeds to see if this is the control on why some magmas erupt more explosively than others. Thank you. <laughs>